G'day guys, welcome back to the Football Come Down. Another unreal round of footy. This season keeps throwing up different curveballs. My footy tipping was a mess. I'm relieved to hear that was true for a few other people because I it was almost a self-esteem hit how bad my footy tipping was this week. So many close games, couple of stinkers. This video is about wrapping the weekend and will the flow of the conversation will largely go around your comments and contributions, which you kindly did on the YouTube community tab. So we've got a few general comments about the round to work through. Then we're going to go through game by game. I'll give my general thoughts and respond to your comments. So let's start off with Tiger Walker, who says this season is getting better and better. I agree. I don't know if this is recency bias, but I feel like this might be probably, it's certainly the best season I think I've covered on True Footy with the amount of uncertainty and curveballs and question marks around every team that then goes out and plays an outstanding game the following week. And the fact that we've had a finals race like this, and we have no idea who's going to finish top four, let alone, I'm not even convinced Sydney's going to win the minor premiership. They, they should from here, but who knows? Sean Christie says, so many close games and unexpected wins and losses across the board and up and down the ladder. Not sure about playing two games simultaneously on two separate occasions on Saturday. Channel 7 Queensland do better three games for the whole weekend of footy. Yeah, obviously I'm not watching um, Channel 7 or anything like that, but we did have a pretty good record of staggering the games, I reckon, in the first half of the year, and that's for some reason changed. Samantha Jane, a member of the channel, says, away wins for both Gold Coast and West Coast. Dockers drop a winnable home game. What a great weekend of football. The balance of the force has been restored. Brisbane falter against the Giants, while Sydney potentially getting a little bit of their mojo back. Great round of footy. Absolutely agree with you. Max Hansen, this is an interesting comment. AFL fans have not only been treated to an amazing season with an insanely tight ladder and finals race, but we've been spoiled with a crazy amount of close games in the last fortnight. From the start of round 21 to the end of round, uh, end of Saturday night on round 22, we have had games of 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 5, 5, 10, 11, 13, and 18. That's absurd. That's absurd, and my club has been involved in a couple of those thrillers. Um, three thumpings, of course, in round 21. We'll ignore those. Pull your head in 92. Says, takeaways are my tips are fingered. Oh, my God. But love the West Coast win. I'm pretty much right there with you. So sick to see Mac Andrew win the game after the siren. The Essendon loss just sums them up, really. We will get to that. There's a fair bit of Essendon talk. What did they kick? One goal nine in the last quarter. Yeah, their polish was lacking. Giants have proven me wrong. Me too. I was about to give up on them a few weeks ago. And what a cracker game tomorrow between the Hawks and the Blues. That did not pan out that way. Amusement Productions. Bold call. Australian rules football is a better sport than breakdancing. That is bold. <laughs> the memes are incredible. G Bags finally says, Hawks and the Bulldogs are two teams that no one will want to match up on in finals. Now, I know that this was probably posted before the Bulldogs had their asses handed to them by the Adelaide Crows. Absolutely agreed with this going into this round. Hawthorne proved it that right. The Bulldogs, we don't know. They just hor they just hate Adelaide, apparently, the, the city. They've been horrendous there this year. Let's talk about the round of footy. So Sydney versus Collingwood was an intriguing one. I changed my tip last minute to Sydney, and thank God I did, because my tipping would have been even worse. But the Swan Swans trail by 27 points in the final term before doing a Collingwood. And coming from the clouds to win this game, in particular, I think Heaney and Warner were huge. I know Golden, Golden sorry, didn't play his best game across four quarters, but kicked the winning goal and uh, effectively ends Collingwood's season. If it wasn't already, they sort of had a little bit of a pulse after the Carlton win, and Sydney equally really needed this. Now, this could be a fire starter and a, certainly a circuit breaker from a poor run of form. Who knows? With the competition as even as it, as it is, it's just going to be about who plays best in September, but it is critical for them to try and get that double double chance and also two home finals, which will uh, be the case if they finish top two. Great game of footy, really. Well, it was kind of weird. Like, it is, a, it was a great game, particularly the comeback. I, I remember watching it and, and thinking, wow, the, the crowd sounds weird in this game. Like, it doesn't sound right. I just assumed it was the audio, you know, equalizing, and I just couldn't hear the crowd that well. But the commentators were talking about it, too. G-Bag says, Chad Warner's goal-kicking ability as a midfielder is truly unmatched. Yeah, he was huge for, in this game and kicked, uh, well, at least one good goal. I can't remember how many he ended up with, but I remember one from around about 50. He was fantastic. And the way he combined with Heaney so much in this in this game was outstanding. Shadow Light says, Collingwood effectively out and gone from finals is reminiscent of the Cats' recent premiership defense. Very difficult to achieve, especially when you couldn't make the eight to do it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. Um, so on Collingwood, yeah, weird season, you know, poor start to the year, followed by a nine-week run that I'm almost, I almost forgot happened. I mean, they were fantastic. I know West Coast played him right in the middle of that. And then they got up to third. That's the part I didn't really remember. 
Um, so to see Carlton Collingwood at Essendon, who was second, third, and fourth, I think, not that long ago, all outside the eight, I think, at the end of this round, is absolutely unreal. Let's talk about Brisbane GWS. Now, this game was at the same time as North and West Coast, but I did my best to catch up on it, and I was certainly following it at the time because it has you know, a huge effect on the ladder because I thought Brisbane might have been going for that double chance, and now top four is not even guaranteed for them. But got out to a five-goal lead. It was very one-sided. GWS continuing this little trend of poor starts, strong finishes, outscoring their opponent to ultimately win by 18 points. Um, Aaron Cadman was fantastic in this game. Bit of a coming-of-age game, perhaps. I mean, he's had a pretty good year, I think. 20-plus goals. Um, Darcy Jones was another big one. And the Giants and their tsunami, they're just looking fantastic. Might be priming themselves uh, at the right time of year. It's not an easy thing to go beat the Lions at the Gabba. Okay, they, they dropped a few games at the start of the year, but in this current run of form, this, this is a particularly seismic result and in terms of the effect it's having on the ladder. And now GWS, I don't know. I think they're currently in the top four, but with a game against Fremantle and then somebody else in the last round, who knows? But this is probably a bad time to play GWS. Ah, sorry, I've got it in front of me here. The Giants play the Bulldogs in the final round in Ballarat. And who knows what to make of that game? I'm sick of like labeling teams as either done or you know a serious flag chance only for them to make me look silly the following week. We've got a couple of comments. Sammy the Sloth says, the kid with the lid is fast becoming my favorite player. Without context, I'm gonna assume you meant Darcy Jones. I haven't actually heard that nickname. It sounds like something Dwayne Russell would say. I often listen with the commentary turned out. He's a gun. And I think GWS have really drafted well lately. Gbag says, Jesse Hogan will win the Coleman this year. That's looking very much safe now. Kerno did it ankle. Not sure if he's going to play. He does play West Coast next week, though. He loves playing West Coast. I think he kicked 19 goals or something against West Coast. So we'll see if he gets up. But yeah, Hogan's had an unreal season. Let's talk about North and West Coast. This game has been well covered on my two channels. So we, we did a live stream, which was fantastic. And uh, I've covered it from an Eagles perspective on my Eagles channel, True Eagle. But we got a heap of comments. Um, I think you all know basically what happened in this game. West Coast come from the clouds to steal victory in the dying stages uh, in even more dramatic circumstances than last week. So we'll get straight to the comments because there's a bit of discussion. James Daly loves West Coast Eagle, says Oscar Allen is a legend. It's nice to see this guy shake off a little bit of form to to still impact you know from limited opportunities so that's been the tale of his last couple of months so you know he's he's taken a few few, few like strong hangers in the third quarter and kicked a couple of goals but ultimately has looked a little rusty and this he overcame a slow start kicked five goals in the second half and the match when he's un unreal Darth Jaja says Eagles kicking three goals in a minute yeah I think it was like a minute and ten of gameplay Leo King member of the channel says Jerry McGovern has to be an All-Australian be, being the best centre-half back this year by a long way, I'm terrified of the Eagles, where the Eagles would be without him. So the unfortunate reality is we've had a pretty good look of what we look like without him. I know what you mean, though. This season, um, he's been probably our best and fairest, I would say. And I agree, a worthy All-Australian. He's been very consistent. He's missed a few games. I know Pierce is injured, so we'll see how that works out. Jack Crow says, as a North fan, Oscar Allen is probably my favourite player from another team, formidable beast. Also the sort of player you'd like, or the sort of bloke you wouldn't mind taking your daughter out, you know? Like, he just seems like a really nice young chap. I love Oscar Allen. And Tequila Eater says, Flag Eagles 2025. <laughs> oh, we'll see, we'll see. So we got a few more North ones now. Sheasel Enthusiast. Man, it's a lot of Sheasel fans, which is, doesn't surprise me, I suppose. If North want to move up the ladder, they have to get rid of Luke McDonald. His unforced errors in defense kill momentum and cause the entire team to drop their heads, which is a scene in the game versus the Eagles. This was a weird game for North Melbourne. I actually, you know, being an Eagles fan, I wasn't focusing too much on individual players at North Melbourne, but I do remember one absolute howler. He, he made a switch and kicked it out of bounds in the full in his own back pocket. I don't remember what happened after that, but I have seen the Luke McDonald sentiment pop up quite a lot. LD Sports 933 says, North have clearly got some serious young talent. However, the rebuild isn't gonna get far if they don't go after some quality experienced players this off season. I do, I do somewhat agree with this. I'm not going to put a limit on what they can achieve if they don't do that, but I've been saying this for a while. Experience is necessary. I think the lack of experience definitely shown in the two games they coughed up big leads against Collingwood and the Eagles. The only reason they haven't won four consecutive wooden spoons is because of West Coast and Richmond having some of the worst injury lists I've ever seen. I think, unfortunately, there is some truth to this. But I think, you know, North more or less did this 
to their list willingly, which is some of the conversation I've been having on this channel for a little while now. Look, I mean, rather than going all doom and gloom, I think if you look at the stats and we'll get to another comment, but North did dominate every single stat in this game, basically, except stoppage clearances, which is usually something they're good at, which is weird. Uh, it was just the fadeaways, the ball use inside 50, and you know, it was a senior players that stood up for West Coast again. Shadow Light says, Sherry is an AA lock. I think I'm gonna have to agree with that now. I think I've fully moved over the threshold of thinking maybe to now, surely. Uh, he also says, North dominated the game in every facet against the Eagles, save for uh, shot at goal accuracy. Credit to the Eagles, they made the most of every chance they got despite both sides kicking 12 to 13 behinds. The win can be won at any time, and that time came for the Eagles in the last 90 seconds. Um, yes, I, I think it's probably more than just the night last 90 seconds, not to push back too hard, but kicked 12 goals in a quarter and a half. So it really wasn't just a last little burst. I think that, that this was coming for a while. And absolutely, it was down to senior players for the second week in a row, lifting and being unwilling to lose a game. And to contrast the, the Gold Coast game, the Gold Coast game, we just were unwilling to lose. And in a very even game, we managed to take our opportunities late. The North one felt more like the Eagles really believed they could win and just played with ultimate confidence. And in particular, in the last few minutes, just waltzed the ball into their forward 50 and did what they liked. And frustrating for North fans, I, I think there's still a fair bit to be taken out of it. Had they been beaten in every facet of the game and lost this game, it would be more deflating. But... I think they're on the right track. I do think some experience would be handy though. So that was a big talking point, that game. We'll move to Fremantle versus Geelong. And uh, I have to say, I, uh, I I probably need to apologize for not having faith in Geelong. I didn't think they should win this game. I thought Fremantle would be too good. And uh, you know, from the outset, the pressure that Geelong put on it, I think it was 26 to eight tackles in the first quarter, set up a big lead, which ultimately, you know, well, they win by 11 points. And that was where Fremantle really couldn't make up that ground. And uh, it was 58 to 27 tackles across the four quarters. So that's the biggest stat that stands out about this game. Dangerfield, outstanding. And probably a player that I had kind of not thought would be a huge factor this year, probably just because of these you know, turning 34, but I feel like there's a huge correlation to Dangerfield playing and playing well and Geelong's success as a team. Now, going into finals, is that balance what they want? Um, maybe, maybe not. We'll see. It's a very even competition, but they're winning games and to beat Fremantle in Perth is no easy feat. Some good teams have gone there and failed to do that this year. We'll move straight to the comments. Uh, ben, the Hoops Show, uh, you know, check out the, the Hoops crew on YouTube if you're a Geelong fan. I don't know if I have a lot of Geelong fans interacting with True Footy that much, but yeah, if you are one, they do a great channel. He says, Geelong is still Geelonging. Agreed. User says, cats can still win the flag if danger is fit and firing. I agree. I mean, you... <laughs> Only because the competition is so even that it's really about who's going to play well in September. Geelong, I think, are the sort of team that, you know, they can win away from home. I'm not too concerned about that. Being relatively one-dimensional, I mean, that's harsh. They've got stars all over the field, don't they? But, you know, I think from a midfield point of view and a clearance point of view, um, they're looking a little bit shallow. But that being said, like, I think this has been a fantastically successful season to be competing when your list is in transition um, you know, that's very Geelong-esque. Musy Cats fan says, what a gutsy grinding win against Frio. Massive respect for Frio. They're so tough to beat over there. We are Geelong. This is a really good win for Geelong, and they've certainly gone up in my estimations. Pickle Green Guy says, my point from last week still stands. Frio can't close out games. Yes, I remember when you posted that comment, I looked at it going, is that a thing? Um, it is undoubtedly a thing, so you were absolutely bang on because no team has lost more than Fremantle that when they have led at three-quarter time, it's five occasions this year. The bad start also cost them in this game. Frio better says flag mantle anyway. Oh, Shane, Shane Trabasta says Frio, we're done missing the eight now. That is a very realistic um, possibility. So, I mean, I won't rule them out because they've got GWS at Monica, or certainly away from home. They've got the power at home. They could win both games because Fremantle can be that sort of team. But, you know, if you play the percentages, if they only win one, I think they miss now that Hawthorne's won. Fidget says Frio suck from stoppages. Um, I mean, they're a great clearance team, the best, in fact. But transitioning that into a scoring opportunity has been something that's cost them when they're not playing well. Jaden says, despite how well Fremantle have been this season, they are a genuine chance to miss the top eight. Agreed. Yeah, it's going to be a big couple of weeks for them. They had a tough run of four. They've now 0 from 2 in games I thought they would win. Crazy season, man. Let's move to Essendon versus Gold Coast. Now, I was switching between two games here. I think I watched more of the Melbourne Port game, and that was a mistake. But I thought with the flow and effect it would have 
on the rest of the top eight, I chose the wrong game to watch, but I managed to catch the end of this. So we saw Gold Coast come from the clouds and claim their first away victory all season. And, um, you know, it was a terrific win. And unfortunately, there was an an error of predictability about this. You could see it coming. (laughs) You know, when Gresham kicks that goal and it's overturned, um, which was a clear uh, push in the back, in my opinion. But anyway, Essendon kicking one goal nine in the final term really summed this up. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's an effort thing. It was certainly a polished thing. Unable to put teams away. That's probably been the tale this year. You know, look at their percentage. They've had games where they've won. They haven't won by much. So really frustrating, underscoring a frustrating season for Essendon fans. So on the one hand, uh, let's we'll just get straight to the comments because that kind of flows into the conversation. So the Laughing Magpie says the Big Mac is a big talent. He's unreal. So the last two weeks they've thrown him forward. Big factor against West Coast again was the match-winning play in this game. Good for him. He's a star. AFL Snaps says the Suns away streak is over May 2023 to August 2024. Is that date right? They probably. I mean, if they hadn't won a away game all year, surely they'd lost some in April. Anyway, you're right. Marcelo says, Mac Andrew is becoming an incredible footballer. So versatile. He can play back and forward. And when, with seven goals in two weeks and a match winner after the siren, he can win you games. Yeah, I think it's an interesting conversation who the most improved footballer in the competition is. He's in that conversation. I mean, the ones that come to mind, uh, just straight off the bat, Jake Waterman, Tristan Cherry, Jake Saligo, um, and Massimo D'Ambrosio, who have probably slept on a little bit. Mac Andrews right up there. And there's more. I'm just talking off the top of the head. So a good win for Gold Coast to, you know, overcome a bit of a hoodoo. I, I don't think they've been too bad away from home, I suppose. I mean, looking at just on Gold Coast for a minute, when they lost to North at Marvel, Hardwick's frustration was palpable. He dropped an F-bomb in the press conference. I thought against West Coast they were unlucky to come at us at a time where, for, the, for that one game, West Coast refused to lose. And that was the first time I'd seen them play like that for a long time. And I think you look at Hardwick's press conferences and he was relatively less frustrated and he gave a lot of credit for West Coast in that game. And West Coast was able to back that up the following week. I think to do that, to go from Perth and then play in Melbourne, which I don't know why is the case, by the way, to do that, whereas Essendon haven't traveled in months. I don't know if that's factually accurate, but they've played a few home games in a row, three home games in a row against interstate sides. For Gold Coast to win that is huge. Let's talk about Essendon. There's a few comments. Essendon are a meme, says S10. Big Mac has ended Essington, says Papley. And Shadow Light says Essendon have reached a new low, being Gold Coast's first away loss in a long, long time. A culture of not making finals is the only consistency to exist at the hangar right now. Yeah, it's a tough one for, for Essendon. Three, three home games again against um, interstate sides, beaten by the Crows. Good win against Fremantle and beaten at the last gasp. This for the second time in three weeks. Adelaide was also at the last gasp. It is it is a frustrating season for them, but I one thing that I'll note about this Essendon stuff is that the conversation so regularly gets blown out to the last 20 years. Whenever Essendon falls short, the shortcomings of this current side, I just think should be looked at and isolated a little bit away from what was happening in 2008. 2011, 2013, obviously that was the Asada scandal, but it's a, it's a snap reaction every single time Essendon fall short that they are just struggling under their culture. Now, th- th- to some extent that could be true and to lose th- two games in three from winning positions against sides that will not be playing finals, uh, that is worthy of criticism. So I don't want to sweep that under the rug. But at the same time, I think they're probably still going to finish higher than they did last year. 12 months ago, they're, they're cataclysmic end of the season, I don't know if that's the right word, um, was horrendous, particularly the the last two rounds against GWS and Collingwood. So I know that's probably not acceptable progress to a lot of Essendon fans, and the the team is mature. So I understand that they should be aiming to play finals, but sometimes I just think we we snap back to this whole 20-year thing, and I think if we just, I think it's unhelpful for Essendon to be thinking like that, looking at what's happened in the last 20 years. We need to narrow the focus on what's happening with this group, under Brad Scott, I mean, the CEO's changed. I think there's a danger to rinsing and repeating and the cultural stuff. I think there's a mentality issue there. I don't think all hope is lost, but it is a frustrating season. Melbourne v Port Adelaide. This game was a bit of a stinker considering the thrilling finish, I suppose. I suppose the main takeaway is Port Adelaide claimed a win against a side that was, you know, trying really hard, <laughs> I suppose. Um, and they won a game you'd expect them to. And, and you know, 
even premiership seasons or where seasons where teams will you know finish high on the ladder they still have these ugly wins and a few weeks ago i think port adelaide got an ugly win against st kilda and they've done that this week Horn France is probably the biggest takeaway um, with a huge game when he had 27 disposals and two goals and six marks. I think it were all in the final quarter, six marks in the final quarter, and will do slide over the line, and that is a huge plus for them. Melbourne, you know, the, the daggers through the heart of the season at the moment. Um, you know, that was probably just the inevitable. The fact that they got within two points is something, but it was an ugly game. So we'll just get straight to the comments. Just Cos says, Port Adelaide are top three as premiership contenders, beaten Carlton, Sydney, and Melbourne in the last month, and have won six of the last seven now. Shadowlight says, what a gross game to happen at all. Either team could have won, and Port pulled it in well enough like any top eight uh, team should. Will anyone dare rewatch that game? No, I don't think so either. <laughs> um, look, yes, I think the run of form here from Port Adelaide is, is good, and, and I think you look across the competition at teams dropping winnable games, and this could have been Port Adelaide this week. Don't know how many learnings there are from this game, but uh, they're well poised now, second on the ladder, and it'll be really intriguing how they go from here. They've got a showdown where there's a bit of a mental hurdle to get over that, and Fremantle in Perth is not easy as well, so their destiny is in their own hands. So we move to the Sunday games. Carlton absolutely got their pants pulled down by Hawthorne here. This was probably the tip I was least confident about, and I got Hawthorne right, thankfully. Look, there's some context here. Carlton had a number of injuries throughout the game. They've been dealing with injuries all year. Kerno's one of them. I think it was at the end of the first quarter he went off. Um, and Hawthorne just blitz them. Now, I don't know if injuries are the entire story. I think there's a few narratives happening here at the same time. This would be a really disappointing loss for Carlton and almost ruins their season. I don't think that's the case considering they've got two very winnable games to end the year and they're still in the finals mix. But, you know, if, if there was anything left for Hawthorne to prove about whether they deserve to be in the top eight, well, they just did it. Like, going into this game, Hawthorne needed to win by 10 goals to close the margin, which was very important in the context of making the eight, because if they'd only won narrowly, they'd still need to make up that percentage in their final two wins. And they did it in one game with what was in the end, 74 points? My God. Uh, heart breaks a little bit for Carlton fans. It's been a rough season. To be sitting second after, what was it? I think it was second on the ladder in the middle of round 19. Five losses in six weeks. Losing to Collingwood last week. Oh, it's just... My heart goes out to you a little bit. On the other hand, Hawthorne outstanding. And I would reaffirm that idea that you don't want to play Hawthorne in this final series. I think Fox Footy did their projected top eight in first week of the finals, which means nothing because it is so unpredictable at the moment. But Bulldogs versus Hawthorne, week one of the finals, whew, two of the wildcard teams in the comp. That's the, that's the elimination final I would like to see. So we'll get straight to some comments. Sporty Panda Boy says Hawthorne should make the top eight. I agree with you now. This was the game they needed to win, and they still need to win their last two games, but my confidence with them is relatively high. Now we've got a big one from Nathan Begg. Hawthorne has the most complete and comprehensive list of young players in the league. They all work so well together that none of them stand out more than the other in stats, which led many to think none of them are star players. No player better exemplifies this than Jai Newcomb. Although his stats are down from last year, his influence is only increased as more teams have to be wary of him. Also, Paul Carlton would have loved to see them play finals, but with his menu, um, this many injuries, menu injuries, I'll have the Caesar salad, please. I don't think Hawthorne is the best team in the comp right now, just that the chemistry and fluidity of play is one of, if not the best. I agree with all of that. I just did my AFL 22 and under, tw under 22, and I probably messed that up. I know. I'm sure I got a couple of them wrong, and a lot of people saying I should have had... Uh, Massimo D'Ambrosio in, and I really did think about Connor McDonald as well, even Ginevan. But my point there is because it wasn't clear that any Hawthorne player, in my opinion, should have been in that team, maybe I got Massimo wrong, tough midfield to break into. It just speaks to the fact that they're all just kind of taking turns being outstanding and been very good, and they're a very good team with their chemistry, their fluidity of play is a really good point. The way they transition from defense to attack, their skills... It is, it is very much a quality team that we're seeing at Hawthorne, made up of very good players without necessarily being Brownlow contenders or anything like that. Fallow says, Hawthorne's loss to GWS doesn't look so bad now, especially after a performance against the Blues. We should definitely make finals now. This is true. GWS, storm time late against Hawthorne, did the same thing to the team that appeared to be the best in the competition. Papley says, season over for the Blues, either extremely unlucky or do they need to have a look at some new medical staff? Did somebody retire? Who was it? Um, he was a former player. Forgive me. Uh, I'm being ignorant. It was somebody retired from Carlton and I think is in charge of their high performance or fitness. Jaden says, with all the uh, Carlton's injuries, West Coast have a chance of beating the Blues. Dare I say it? Maybe, but I don't know, man. The last two times we've played Carlton, we've lost by 100 points. 
I wouldn't bet on that. I wouldn't bet on that. But intersecting at a good time for West Coast fans, in theory, I'd rather it be this way than, you know, Carlton and Red Hot form and us being horrendous. Richmond versus St Kilda was another game that probably didn't catch many eyeballs. And in fact, we only have one comment. Um, look, scrappy game. Felt like St Kilda defended well, used the ball poorly. Um, Richmond equally just kept having their entries intercepted. Um, you know, Dan Rioli had a great, great game, 36 disposals and 10 marks. Really... <laughs> bringing another question mark on whether they should trade him. I've done a whole video on this. But St Kilda respond after a disappointing game last week against the Brisbane Lions. Uh, again, it's just a topsy-turvy season. Um, I, I don't really have too much to say. This is a dead rubber. Richmond can sign to the bottom of the ladder. St Kilda are getting a little bit of, uh, I suppose it's good form at the end. I think, you know, they looked a little bit scrappy. I and mean, defensively, they're good. They just need a little bit more polish, which has felt like the case for a long time now. Sefia says, we actually competed against St Kilda for three quarters again after two or something months. Yeah, like I've, I've said before, Richmond have competed well this year. I don't think they've put themselves to shame considering their injuries. And finally, the final game of the round was a, a stunning result, to be honest, because I, I, I mean, I've highlighted before that Hall, uh, the Adelaide are just so hard to predict and the, the gap between their best and worst is very, very divergent. Um, and to come up against a very good rampaging Western Bulldog side and trounce them was a very interesting result. And it probably does bode well. I think if Adelaide can have these games where they show some of their best form, it only is a good thing for next year, even if they're going to finish bottom four or five at this current point in time. But the Bulldogs probably ruined their top four chances with this result. And again, it's a really poor trip to Adelaide in this mix of really good form. What is it about Adelaide? They won a prelim final there by 70 points with... A fair bit of the same team still playing. So anyway, I'm not really too sure what to make of that other than this was a really dirty day for the Bulldogs. The Ruck battle certainly caught my attention. Tim English against Riley O'Brien. Tim English, you know, being an All-Australian Ruck. Riley O'Brien, if I could be wrong, but I feel like he's getting some hate from Adelaide fans. They don't want him in the team. Uh, he's always been a good tap Ruckman, but this was an absolute belting. An absolute belting. Bulldogs really poor in front of goal as well, and that was probably uh, one factor that cost them the game, but they lost by seven goals. Sam Darcy played well, don't get me wrong, 21 disposals or something like that. 11 score involvements, but had seven shots of goal and keep one goal five with one out on the full. So dirty day for the Bulldogs. Unfortunately, it's not just that, because I thought they were going to make the top four with a win this game, and now they're probably probably going to find it tough. And again, I think they've got... Um, they've certainly got GWS at Ballarat. Is there other game North Melbourne or something like that? So yeah, it's the sort of season where they need to win both games. But overall, good performance from Adelaide. And you know they they got bested in the inside 50s, but they were clinical. We know they have a pretty good forward line. Fogarty was good. Isaac Rankin's a great midfielder as well. There's some green shoots there for Adelaide in an otherwise frustrating season. So those are my thoughts on a very, very interesting round 22. I keep saying it. It's, it's true. We don't have any real shitty rounds anymore. It's been a fantastic season. So let me know in the comments what else you thought about this round, and I will see you soon. Probably for just the tips will be my next video. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next one.